Hello, everyone. Uh, this is John Eyes at Central Region Headquarters SSD, and welcome to our ongoing series of science sharing webinars. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Dick Wagenmaker, the MIC at White Lake Detroit uh, WFO, and his title is Diagnosing EF Scale Potential Using Conditional Probabilities. Uh, this is excellent material you should be able to use actually directly for impact based warnings. So without further ado, uh, Dick, it's all yours. OK. Thanks, John. And good morning to everyone. And thanks for attending. Um, as John said, this presentation will be about creating an operational application for diagnosing EF scale potential using conditional probabilities and low-level rotational velocities. The, the work is adapted from some recent studies uh, in 2012 and, and 2014 by Brian Smith Rich Thompson, Andy Dean, and uh, Patrick Marsh, uh, all affiliated with SPC. And, and I believe their most recent study has been submitted to Weather and Forecasting. Uh, you can find it on the Central Region IBW training Google site if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's, it's really good. It's, it's, it's groundbreaking in many ways. Um, uh, as John also said, this has obvious applications for, for IBW concepts. And, and we'll go through a methodology for converting some of the study's findings to something that can be applied to tornado warning decision making. So let's go on to the next slide there, John. OK, so first, uh, just a little background on the Smith study. Uh, over 4,000 tornadoes were evaluated. Uh, a convective mode was assigned at the beginning of each event, uh, either a right moving supercell, QLCS, mm -hmm. or just plain uh, disorganized convection. You'll see in the data set that almost 90% of all EF2 or stronger tornadoes occur in right-moving supercells. So that's, that's really where we should focus most of our efforts. The remaining uh, EF2 plus events are associated with QLCS events, and uh, none were associated with, with disorganized convection. Um, Low-level rotational velocity information was, was gathered uh, uh, for each circulation associated with a tornado. Uh, starting with the volume scan prior to touchdown and, and lasting through the lifetime of the tornado. And then the peak value was recorded and, and compared to the maximum EF scale damage recorded for that tornado. Um, most importantly, no cases were not considered in this study, uh, meaning that you know, the probabilities for tornado intensity that were derived in the study are conditional upon a, uh, a tornado actually occurring. Uh, this is certainly a limitation of the study, but the use of conditional probabilities in operational meteorology goes back a long way. Um, in short, forecasters just need to remain aware that they're working in conditional probability space when, when they're applying these techniques. And this is, this is a point that I'll be hammering on throughout the, the presentation. Uh, for what it's worth, data is being collected on null cases uh, uh, for future study, but, but for now, this is what we have. Uh, near storm environment, you know, this being an SPC study, uh, the authors also compared EF scale to uh, the SPC SIGTOR parameter as kind of a proxy for the near storm environment. And we'll look at that a little bit at, uh, at these kind of comparisons at the, uh, the end of the presentation. Um, next, the development of conditional tornado probabilities. Uh, you'll see that the raw probabilities from the study are range and mode independent, and that Raw probabilities alone are really insufficient for decision makers. And so instead, by, by using things like box, box and whisker plots, you can pull out key bits of information by normalizing the database, filtering outliers, uh, distinguishing between convective mode, and then I'll try to apply that in a probabilistic sense. And that's one of the main things that we'll, we'll be going through in this presentation. And then finally, we'll see a forecaster uh, forecasters play a key role in this process. Uh, I, listening to, uh, to Lance Rothfuse's uh, facets presentations, uh, I noticed that there was some concern among, among some people that probabilistic approaches in warnings would decrease forecaster involvement in the process. Uh, but I think in this presentation, you'll see that that is not necessarily the case. Uh, by getting the right the, the point of the exercise here is, is kind of to provide you with a a sense of the rotational velocity neighborhood that you're operating in when you're deciding on issuing enhanced tags in your warnings. Uh, you'll see that there are really no simple decision thresholds, but that you'll be working on a, a spectrum of outcomes uh, where forecaster judgment and skills is, is going to be very important. OK, let's move on. 
All right, this is just a quick map of, uh, of uh, 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 I think you need to step back. You jump the slide here, uh, John. Step back one. There you go, key definitions. Most of these definitions were covered on the previous slide, but uh, what I want to do is just reemphasize a couple of points before we move on. Um, first, the, the max low-level rotational velocity collected in the Smith study did not have to be gate-to-gate. So obviously, when rotational couplets are gate to gate, they will they will command more weight in the in the operational decision making process. So you need to keep that in mind. Uh, secondly, the convective mode was determined subjectively. Uh, third, uh, raw probabilities are defined as those derived from the unfiltered, non-normalized data set comparing max rotational velocity to EF scale. And the normalized conditional probabilities are, are those derived after filtering the outliers and normalizing the database uh, across the EF scale. Essentially, what we'll be doing is, is weighting contributions from each of the EF scale bins equally. OK, jump ahead. All right, here's the map that uh, just a simple image showing the, the, the geographical distribution of tornadoes used in the study. Uh, over 4,000 tornadoes were sampled, as I mentioned. Uh, with the greatest con concentration there in the mid uh, mid south region. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a plot showing all the raw data used in the Smith study. Uh, you know, over like I said, over 4,300. So it's kind of messy. Uh, over there on the y-axis on the left side of the graph is the effective effective layer sig tor parameter, um, and that's there to kind of serve as a proxy for the mesoscale environment near the time of the tornado. Uh, the x-axis along the bottom of the graph is, is the, uh, the max rotational velocity at the half-degree slice, and that's in knots. Uh, the dots are, are the measured maximum EF scale uh, damage associated with each tornado. Small dots are, are EF0, uh, more than two. Those are the gray, blue, and green. And then the brighter colored larger dots are the EF3, 4, and 5. The key takeaways from, from this plot uh, are that the raw data set is dominated by the population of EF-01 tornadoes. Uh, it's almost five times greater than the population of EF-2 and 5 tornadoes. You can also see a weak relationship between the SIGTOR parameter and tornado intensity along the, the y-axis, and, and a moderate to strong relationship between increasing half-degree uh, rotational velocity and tornado intensity. OK, next slide. All right, this is kind of messy too, kind of spaghetti-like. Uh, this is uh, this graph you, uh, using the raw, unfiltered, full sample of data. What you can do is calculate in probabilistic terms the most likely EF scale outcome for a given rotational velocity. Again, conditional on tornado occurrence. I want to keep hammering that home. Uh, you can you can easily see how the, the raw probabilities are dominated by EF zeros on the low end of the uh, the VRAP scale and by large tornadoes on the high end. Um, in the middle, it's a lot less certain, uh, as you can see there. Uh, for example, with a, a rotational velocity of 65 knots, the, the most probable outcome of tornado intensity is EF2, which is the, the green line. Uh, but the raw probability of EF2 at that point is only about 35%. So I'm, I'm not really sure how useful this is in the middle ranges, probably not that much. But there are other ways that we can look at this to come up with more operationally useful information. So we'll move on to the next slide. OK, and this is the same data set that we'll look at only in, in an IBW framework. And that is where we're, we're targeting EF0 and 1 tornadoes for base warnings and EF2 to 5 uh, tornadoes for considerable or, or higher tags. The EF0 and 1 conditional probability line is the gray one, as you can see. And the, and the dashed line there is the conditional probability for EF2 to 5 tornadoes. And you can see here the threshold where EF2 to 5 tornadoes become the most probable outcome is 60 knots. That's where we're passing, uh, where the lines cross there, the EF, the, the gray line, and the dashed line. And it's right at about 50%. Um, so at this point, we're, we're gradually honing in on some operationally useful value that, given the occurrence of a tornado, uh, uh, however, these are, are still raw probabilities. And the raw data set is, like we have mentioned, it's non-normal. And it's skewed a bit toward the high population EF of EF-01 tornadoes. 
So we can look at this yet another way and try to extract more information to help us. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. OK, in this slide, we're using box and whisker diagrams to analyze it a bit further. And here, the, the tips represent the 10th and, and 90th percentiles. Uh, the boxes are bounded by the first and third quartiles in the data set, and then the dash in the middle uh, of each box uh, represents the median value. Uh, on the x-axis on the left, uh, or the y-axis on the left, rather, is the, uh, 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 the max rotational velocity in knots. Also, in these graphs, you can see the authors attempt to distinguish between convective modes. And we won't focus on that too much, except in a, uh, a qualitative way. Just you know, once again, like I mentioned earlier, just keep in mind that 90% of uh, EF2 plus tornadoes are associated with right moving supercell data set. The red line uh, at 60 knots on the graph represents the conditional threshold for EF2 to 5 tornadoes that we, we derived previously from the raw unfiltered data set in those previous slides. Uh, you can see that 80% of the EF2 population and 40% of the EF3 population still fall uh, actually you know, below the conditional 60 knot threshold for EF2 uh, to 5 tornadoes. And that's a pretty large sample of significant tornadoes that are not being captured by that threshold. So what we want to do next is try to remove outliers beyond the whisker tips, which may result from sampling issues, um, like, like a large tornado rated EF1 because it was in a remote area, uh, or a very broad but strong circulation at long distance from the radar. And then we can use the box and whiskers to normalize the database across EF scale, in, in essence giving each EF scale be an equal weight in this approach instead of allowing the, the, the EF zeros and ones to carry all the weight. OK, next slide, John. OK, there we go. And the normalized and, and filtered probabilities look like this. And again, conditional and tornado occurrence. Uh, the most probable outcome, given a, a max rotational velocity of, of 45 knots um, uh, or less, is EF0 over EF1. And anything exceeding 45 knots, the most probable outcome, depending on tornado, is EF2 to EF5. Uh, and it's interesting to note here the, the red line on the, on the graph there that anything exceeding 77 knots has the most likely outcome of EF4+. plus. OK, next slide, John. OK, so back to the box on whiskers. Putting that 45 knot threshold um, for, uh, for EF2 to EF5s, uh, again, on the box and whisker diagram, and this is the, uh, the 45 knots is now the dashed red line. Uh, you can see that the 45 knot threshold now captures 100% of the EF3, 4, and 5 uh, tornadoes. This is a filtered population, by the way. And roughly 75% of the EF2 population. Um, and also, you know, by lowering the threshold, you can see a small fraction of, of EF zeros are captured, and about 23% of EF ones are also in that mix. So by lowering that threshold, you're going to, you know, capture some of these smaller tornadoes. But hopefully, by doing so, you capture most, if not all, of the larger tornadoes. Okay, next slide, John. All right, now. You know, we're superimposing the, the 45 knot and 60 knot thresholds that we just derived onto the scatter plot here. And those are you know, the red dash line is 45, and the vertical um, black line is the 60 knot threshold that we came up with earlier. Um, and you can see the overlap between small tornadoes and large tornadoes. In other words, there's really no clean threshold for issuing considerable tags. But the data does reveal a, a pretty meaningful separation between uh, radar observations of storms containing weak and strong tornadoes. Uh, and this is a key component in risk assessment that we want to try to communicate in our warnings. Uh, the data also shows there's a pretty clear evidence of a neighborhood that you should expect to be working in when, when uh, the tough decisions come into play. And that's in that overlap area between 45 and 60 knots. And uh, you know, this is where you know, forecaster uh, expertise you know, becomes quite important. These are, like I said, where the tough decisions come into play. Uh, this is a point where I, I think I should also emphasize once again that these are conditional probability thresholds. 
Uh, your first order of business is to determine whether or not a tornado will occur. And then once you reach that decision, then you can make a call on, on whether you need an enhanced tag in your tornado warning or, um, or an SVS upgrade, as, as the case may be. Um, obviously, there's going to be times when, when a pretty significant circulation results in nothing, you know, elevated con convection, for instance, or, or when a rotating you know, supercell gusts out. Uh, we're starting to look at null events in a separate study. Um, uh, to try to fill that gap, but we can we can use some IBW uh, verification results as a, as a bit of a proxy for how null events might impact a study like this. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, for example, uh, all of the warnings that we've issued during IBW that have had an enhanced tag over the last two years had uh, a false alarm rate of 26 percent, compared to 67 percent FAR for for all base tornado warnings uh, that we issued. Bottom line is, is that the forecaster role in this process is to anticipate using all the information at your disposal. You know, it's important because, again, of that fuzzy threshold um, between EF1 and EF2 tornadoes, and because of the need to capture those higher end events for the, with a certain degree of lead time. So the following slides um, here, we're showing this operational op application that we kind of come up with, uh, again, with a a first order of business determining whether a tornado will occur. And then the steps below, these four steps below, will then help you determine if an enhanced tag is appropriate in your warning. And uh, you know, these, we'll go through these one at a time. Um, uh, and we'll start with uh, number one there. Go ahead and hit the next slide there, John. There you go. We'll highlight that. Using your situational awareness of the, of the mesoscale scale in near storm environment. And you're, Again, as you know, we're, we're looking for things like examining Cape Shear relationships, uh, looking at STC mesoscale scale analysis for environments favorable for larger tornadoes. And, and this graphic here shows the relationship between the SIGTOR parameter and, and EF scale. This was done by, uh, by Rich Thompson at STC. Uh, also being aware of low-level boundaries conducive for, for rapid tilting or stretching of local vorticity ma maxima, et cetera. So those are the things we're looking for in that, in that first bullet. Hit the next slide there, John. Using your understanding of, uh, of convective modes, obviously their uh, uh, right-moving supercells are most likely to produce tornadoes that require enhanced tags. Uh, QLC storms, interestingly enough, uh, that do produce significant tornadoes appear to do so with, with lower rotational velocity thresholds than right-moving supercells. And, you know, that, I don't know exactly why that is so, but it's possibly due to enhanced forward motion vector contributions on the on the right flanks of, of these low-level circulation. Uh, you know, QLCS storms are usually pretty fast moving. And last, again, obviously, you know, the circulations and disorganized convection are, are highly unlikely to produce uh, tornadoes that, that need uh, enhanced tags. Okay, next slide. Yeah, using your understanding of the character of the low-level circulation, you need to anticipate how convergent low-level circulations will behave given the near-storm environment. Um, also re-emphasizing that uh, uh, both broad VROT maxima and gate-to-gate -gate VROT maxima are used uh, in the study depending on which is strongest for a given case. Uh, uh, the gate-to-gate -gate VROT maxima should be Operationally, to command more weight and a lower VROT for EF2 plus events. And last, you know, just being cognizant of the radar range from the target. Uh, for close in storms, for example, you want to be able to sample as close to the cloud base as, as possible um, uh, for storms that are not yet tornadic. Okay, next slide. And this is the last one. Just using your understanding of what we've just gone through, a raw and, and normalized probabilities of conditional tornado intensity. Um, keeping in mind their conditional probabilities, also remembering that, that lead time is important. Um, use as many tools at your disposal as possible to anticipate you know, tornado occurrence. Um, I also want to emphasize that you don't need to wait for a report of a, a tornado before issuing a considerable damage threat tag. I think that's that idea has been floating around the region, but it's, it's not true. You can, you can issue a considerable tag on, uh, on purely radar-based information. Um, once a, a decision is made, you know, what we've just gone through, I think the, the threshold that you really want to start getting serious about uh, uh, 
using a considerable damage threat tag is 45 knots. Uh, if you get to 60 or above, that's that's a point where you definitely you know should issue a considerable damage threat tag if you think a tornado is going to occur. Uh, the hard decision points are in that area in between. You know, there's probably kind of a sweet spot in there, right around 50 to 55 would be my guess, where, where you're really going to be most effective. All right, next slide. I think that's it, John. Before we take questions, though, I just want to jump ahead a couple of slides. Well, we have time to show a couple of snapshots that, that Rich Thompson provided for this study. Here's, here's an example. Uh, uh, I can't see exactly where this is, but you can see the, the V-ROT in this case was 84.5 knots. ES3 damage occurred at the strong area of, you know, positive SIGTOR parameter. Um, hit the next one there. We'll just do a few of these. Uh, this looks like, uh, this is in Billings, Montana. You can see the V-ROT here is only 40.8, and there's the, the STP is pretty small. That produced EF4 damage. And we'll do one more. There's a whole slew of these. Uh, this one here has a V rod of 46 and oh, 46, 47 knots, and uh, EF2 damage occurred with that. That looks like it's in uh, southeastern Wyoming. But there, like I said, there's a whole bunch of those. I'll leave this presentation is on the uh, 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 the Central Region IBW Google Site training tab. So you know, I urge you to take a look at that. You know, download these. You can look at there's probably about 20 or 30 of these cases that you can kind of step through. And with that, uh, I think we'll take a few questions. Any questions for Dick on his presentation? Well, Dick, you must have done a perfect job. <laughs> I went fast. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, everybody, for coming again. And uh, have a good afternoon coming up. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And thank you.